I'm standing on the remote, windswept North Yorkshire moors. Today, to reach here, you just drive an hour or so north of York. But before the railways came along in the 1830s, it was far easier to get here by sea using the port of Whitby than it was to come over land. Back in the 1600s, one man chose to make these wild lands his home during some of the darkest days for the Catholic Church in Britain. He was a fugitive priest called Father Nicholas Postgate. His story isn't that well known, but it is a fascinating reflection of the turmoil between religion and politics at that period. He died at the age of 83, martyred for preaching Catholicism. It was a terrible death for a humble gardener who, legend has it, introduced the daffodil to Yorkshire. But with so much of his story dating back more than 300 years, is it really possible to separate fact from fiction? Almost a thousand years before Nicholas Postgate's life, religious leaders met here in Whitby to try and sort out differences within the church. A synod was called for 664 AD by Northumbrian King Oswiu. They met here at Whitby Abbey. Oswiu had a religious upbringing following the doctrine of Celtic traditions. Despite this, the king decided to change and follow the rule of Rome. This was a decision which was to have a major impact on the future of the British Isles. Catholicism spread across Great Britain, and all was relatively calm in the church until the 1500s, when European reformists began to challenge the doctrine of the Catholic Church. All of this would perhaps have passed England by if it wasn't for the small matter of Henry VIII wanting a divorce. In 1502, the 11-year-old Henry Tudor was second in line to the throne behind his brother Arthur. Arthur was only 15, but had already been married off to Catherine of Aragon in part of modern-day Spain. But that marriage would only last 20 weeks before Arthur died. Keen to maintain a successful Spanish union, Henry VII instead offered his younger son's hand in marriage to Catherine. But young Henry was reluctant. In fact, he only agreed to the marriage some six years later when his father died and he became king. In 1509, Henry and Catherine were finally married. Twelve days later, it was his coronation. In the decade that followed, Catherine fell pregnant with an heir to the throne many times, but only Mary, born in 1515, survived. Henry was desperate for a son to help him defend against any rival claims to the throne. Increasingly disillusioned with his marriage, he began to have a number of affairs. By 1525, his affections had settled on Catherine's lady-in-waiting, Mary Boleyn. But he was also infatuated with her sister, Anne. Anne refused to become the king's mistress. And with Catherine no longer able to bear children, Henry turned to the Bible for guidance. He would have read in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 21, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. Sir Henry asked Rome to annul his marriage to Catherine, but the Pope was hearing none of it. A furious Henry decided to seize control of the church. The 1534 Parliament Act of Supremacy gave him the power he needed to take control and break links with Rome. He set about systematically destroying the Catholic Church in England. Monasteries like the one at Whitby were ransacked to pay for costly wars and his extravagant lifestyle. Rome was practically powerless. All it could do was excommunicate him from the church. Henry died in 1547. His nine-year-old son, Edward VI, succeeded him, but he too was to die after just six years from tuberculosis. However, during his short reign, he helped establish the now independent Church of England as a Protestant body with his Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Unfortunately, 
The introduction of Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer caused an uprising in Devon and Cornwall, which saw the deaths of 4,000 people. Edward knew he was dying, but he was determined to prevent the return of Catholicism to the country, so he specifically excluded his half-sisters Mary and Elizabeth from the line of succession. Mary was a staunch Catholic, Elizabeth a Protestant, but she had been declared illegitimate following the death of her mother, Anne Boleyn. Instead, Edward nominated his 16-year-old cousin, Lady Jane Grey, as his heir. Unfortunately, history now remembers Jane as England's nine-day queen. Mary seized the throne from her, and Jane was executed in the Tower of London in 1554. Mary and her Spanish husband, Philip, returned England to the Catholic faith, but at great cost. Almost 300 Protestants were burned as heretics, including the former Archbishop, Thomas Cranmer. Her reign was short. After five years, at the age of 42 with no heir, and in an exceedingly weak state, she finally accepted her only legal successor was her half-sister, Elizabeth. In 1558, Elizabeth was crowned queen. She was popular with Protestants, partly due to the hatred that surrounded Mary's regime. They also knew she would embrace their faith, given that the Catholic Church considered her an illegitimate monarch. But she had to tread carefully to avoid the possibility of a Catholic crusade against her. Elizabeth absolutely intended to carry forward her father's Church of England legacy. Just over a year after her accession to the throne, she passed the 1559 Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity. These two combined meant you had to go to your local Anglican parish church every Sunday and Holy Day or face a fine. People would now have to accept Elizabeth as the supreme governor of the Church of England. She believed that the old religion, without the ability to train priests and with no bishops to ordain them, would eventually die out. But around 1570, the mood began to change. Catholics became perceived as a major threat to the crown. The Pope issued a papal bull excommunicating Elizabeth as an illegitimate heretic, disputing her right to the throne and releasing her subjects from obeying any of her laws and orders. Two years earlier, the very first English-speaking college had been established at Dowie in northern France to train young priests who could then return to England to keep Catholicism alive. The first arrived back in 1574. Twelve years on, in 1586, a number of Catholic conspiracies were exposed, including the Babington plot to replace Elizabeth on the throne with the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was executed the next year, war with Spain was looming, and Britain was fortunate to survive the attempted invasion by the Armada. <laughs> Hundreds of young men travelled abroad for training before returning to secretly minister those who refused to conform to the new Church of England. One of those men was Nicholas Postgate. The remote nature of the Yorkshire Moors helped Catholicism survive the reformation of the church in England. The area was home to a large number of staunch recusant families, that is, families who refused to attend Anglican services and remained loyal to the Catholic church, often supported by wealthy and influential Catholic gentry living in these parts. 
The reticence were also helped by the fact that local vicars and constables would turn a blind eye to their refusal to conform to the Church of England. With easy access to the sea and plenty of inlets along the coast like Robin Hood's Bay, it was easy to smuggle in Catholic priests as though they were contraband. In tight-knit communities such as these, it was essential to maintain good relationships with your Protestant neighbours for the survival of the Catholic priests and those who sheltered them. There's a strong local tradition that Nicholas Postgate was born in the Esk Valley, here at Egdon Bridge, about seven miles upriver from Whitby. What little we do know is that he grew up in a very humble building called Kirkdale House, none of which still stands today. In fact, even in the 1800s, some 200 years after his death, it was described as being literally a cattle shed. We can't be certain of Nicholas's exact date of birth, but believe it was around 1596 or 1597. A commemorative stone was erected in Egton Bridge in 2013 to mark the spot where it is believed he was born and grew up. In 1602, Nicholas's father, James, died, leaving his 23-year-old wife, Margaret, to raise Nicholas, William and Matthew alone in Kirkdale Cottage. We know very little about Nicholas's upbringing, but as Catholics, it's likely they would have been baptised by a passing missionary priest, it being too dangerous to keep Catholic registers at the time. As for Church of England registers, well, these were often poorly kept, with frequent gaps, and a few survive prior to 1650. One set of documents that have survived from the time, which were extremely well kept, are the court records. Back then, smaller offences were tried in something called the Quarter Sessions. That was a court that sat four times a year. Records show that a Nicholas Poskett, a labourer from Egton Bridge, was fined in 1616 for being a member of the Egton Players of Interludes. Travelling actors and wandering minstrels were a popular entertainment in the country at the time. They would travel from village to village performing plays and songs. But while the minstrels had organised themselves enough to have a royal guild, the travelling actors were sometimes not very good. The government even became suspicious of the nature of the plays and the songs, fearing they might have political or religious themes, or perhaps even both. Good sir, do you accuse me of blasphemy? Uh, nay, sir, uh, but thou can neither interpret the word of God or, nor the doctrine of the church on such basis. <laughs> but I am king. You are nothing but a blackguard, oh. sir. By my troth and power legatine within this kingdom, I shall seize the church for mine own. Oh. And... Local authorities were instructed to crack down on these sort of activities, whipping and even branding players as beggars or vagrants if they didn't have a licence to perform. And later, even if they did. Uh, yes, my love. <laughs> oh, sweetest Anne, if thou dost... Two well-known local players, Robert and Christopher Simpson, were both acknowledged to be Catholic. The local magistrate, Sir Richard Cholmley, was even accused of giving them permission to play and sitting in the front row of the audience. In 1616, the Egton players, including Nicholas Poskett, were tried at a local court, the Helmsley Quarter Sessions, for performing popish plays up and down the county and heavily fined as punishment. We can't be certain this is the same Nicholas, but it would seem likely. There is no other record of the players in the quarter sessions documents after this event, so we can only presume they broke up. I find the defendants guilty and fine them 10 shillings each for their actions. Elizabeth's Act of Uniformity required Catholics to attend a weekly Anglican church service or face a fine. But new rules were soon coming to make life increasingly difficult for recusants. After the failed gunpowder plot of 1605, Catholics were forbidden to own a firearm, practice law or medicine, 
or become an MP. Catholics faced punishment on a daily basis. A recusant could be fined £60 or have two-thirds of his land holding taken away from him if he didn't receive Anglican sacrament at least once a year. They weren't allowed to travel more than five miles from their home and their children were denied a full education. It became high treason to obey the authority of Rome rather than that of the king. Remarkably, while some of these acts were repealed in 1650, others remained law until 1829. Contemporary writings reveal the Postgate family suffered for their faith, being made to pay for not going to church. In the 1616 quarter sessions, Margaret was fined 10 shillings. That was the equivalent of a month's wages. In the 1600s, you could be expected to live to the age of 35. Margaret reached the age of 45 before she died in 1624. Her will left the entire family estate to Nicholas's elder brother, Matthew. It was valued at just £40, enough to buy four horses in those days. Sadly for Nicholas, he would not have seen his mother in the last three years of her life. He left England in 1621, bound for France, to train to be a priest. Nicholas trained at Dowie, and one man who can tell me all about Father Postgate's training is the Bishop of Middlesbrough, the Right Reverend Terence Draney. I've been invited to Ushaw, a daughter college of Dowie based in Durham, to meet him. Hello there, Bishop Terry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. You're what, very welcome. What a beautiful room this Absolutely is. Absolutely magnificent. This was the prof's parlour, uh, where all the professors from the college used to eat all their meals each day. I, I was in this place for four and a half years. An extraordinary building, so many different nooks and crannies. Absolutely, you know, built by Pugin. Even, even the door you just opened there, all the door furniture was designed by Pugin personally. Well, it all has a sense of history about it, doesn't yeah, it, almost absolutely. everywhere you go? Yeah, absolutely. So why are we at Ashore College? Well, I have to give you a, a little bit of history. During the reign of Elizabeth I, she declared or decreed that uh, anybody who trained for the priesthood outside of her dominions and was ordained by the authority of the See of Rome was deemed to be a seminary priest, and all seminary priests were considered to be traitors. Um, and so in order to be able to train for the priesthood, the English church had to set up seminaries uh, outside of England. As a result of that, the first seminary to be found, founded was uh, Dowie College, which uh, was originally in the Spanish Netherlands, but nowadays is in, is in France. And that was founded in uh, 1668. What do we know about Dowie? Well, it was originally, uh, uh, there was a Benedictine monastery there, and it was because of that foundation that the, the English gentry sent their sons there to be educated. And also as a result of that, that monastery and that school, uh, the seminary was formed there. It was a safe place. Um, it had, a, a, had a, a, a tried and tested record and people trusted it. So that's why Dowie became the, the, the mother and nurturer of all the other seminaries. What sort of personal commitment was this? There sounds like there was huge risk involved and presumably some cost involved too. Absolutely. There was a financial cost, particularly in the case of Nicholas Postgate. He was considered to be a, a senior scholar. He, he, he was um, in his 20s when he went to, uh, to Dowie, so he would have had some money behind him. And he, in fact, had to pay a fee of three, 300 florins to be able to, to train there. So lot of, lot of uh, financial costs, but tremendous personal cost as well, because any seminary priest was considered to be a traitor. So if he was going to return to England as an ordained priest and was captured, then he would be put on trial and he would be if found guilty, he would be hung, drawn and quartered. So a huge personal cost, really. How long did it take to train to be a priest? Well, it normally took about six years. And Nicholas entered the uh, diary in 1621. And then after a couple of years there, he was asked to take the missionary oath, which meant that he promised that if he was ordained to the priesthood, he would return to England. He wouldn't try and seek a position in France or Spain or wherever. And then he was ordained in 1628 by the Archbishop of Paris. So a good six years where he would be studying philosophy and theology um, 
uh, and church history and things like that, just like um, men have done throughout the ages when they're training for priesthood. After he was ordained, in fact, he remained in the college for a further about 18 months and he looked after the sacristy. And there's a, certainly an entry in the diary which says that he was a really, really good uh, help and advantage to the college while he was there. Once you were in being trained, was there an opt-out? Did some people look at the risks and say, actually, it's not for me, or were they committed? Well, I'd say the very fact that they had the missionary oath meant that there were some who probably did take the easy option, you know, after six years living in Spain or France or, or Rome or somewhere like that, they might say to themselves, well, when I'm ordained, I'll work here rather than going back to England. So they had to take the missionary oath in which they solemnly promised that when they were ordained priests, they would return to England no matter what the consequences were going to be. And when he did go back, Postgate, of course, had an assumed name, presumably to protect his identity. As soon as he entered Dowie, he took on an assumed name. Most of them had assumed names. They didn't use their own names when they were in seminary. Uh, and he took on the... Um, uh, the, the assumed name of, uh, of Whitmore. And he also used the name Watson, which is, was his mother's maiden name. Um, you've got to realise that there were actually, all the seminaries were infiltrated. So it wasn't secure even once oh, no. you were in? It wasn't a secret society? Absolutely not. No, no, no. The, there was certainly infiltration uh, into the seminaries by, by, by government agents, agents of the Queen. There is a picture here which dates back some considerable way. Yep. You can see buildings in the distance. Do we know, was it a large seminary? Was it a small one? No, it was quite a large seminary. And not only did it cater for training men for the priesthood, but it also educated um, laymen as well. So it was quite a large institution. Sadly, the only thing that's left now is an elementary school, a lycée, and they have the original altar uh, that was the altar from the seminary. So artefacts do survive and furniture survives. Yes. And of course, we're very privileged here to actually have a Dowie Bible. Yes, this particular edition of the Dowie Bible, well, it was the first edition, and it was printed in 1635. That's a little bit after Nicholas Postgate was there, but, of, but pretty much... Yeah, contemporary with him and yes. his work in, in the country. This would have been used by the trainees when they were in the seminary and would have been used by priests in the mission as well. What's humbling to think of is that the people who were using this book, this very book, were people putting their lives at risk to keep the Catholic faith alive. Absolutely. Dying for the word of God. Without people like Postgate, there's clearly a risk the Catholic Church withers possibly even dies in that part of the country. Given that, how important is he in, in the history of the church? Well, he kept the faith going. He and people like him, because he wasn't on his own, he and people like him kept the faith going, fed uh, the faith of the, of the people, celebrated the Eucharist, celebrated the sacraments in secret in people's houses, uh, ministered to the sick and the dying uh, at the risk of his own uh, safety. You know, so he was really, he and his ilk, kept the, the, the church going in this part of the world, and we owe so much to him and to his brother priests at that time. Nicholas's training at Dowie cost him £30. But where did he get the money? We know that his mother's entire estate was only worth £40 on her death. Perhaps it was from a generous donation from some of the wealthy Catholic landowners in Yorkshire. After eight years, Nicholas was finally a priest. He celebrated his first Mass on the 2nd of April, 1629. A little more than a year later, he returned to England. It was a brave choice. Already, 140 former students of Dowie had been captured and executed. Their average survival time? Just six months. We know that Nicholas arrived back on the northeast coast on the 29th of June, 1630. He might have made his way to Egton Bridge before walking over 50 miles to the village of Saxton near Tadcaster, where he became the chaplain to Sir William and Lady Jane Hungate of Saxton Hall. He knew the risks and could not have expected to survive long, but in fact he would be a fugitive for the next 49 years. The houses of the gentry provided perhaps the best protection for Catholic priests at times of persecution. Their power and influence could help ensure they weren't caught. Nicholas could have hidden himself amongst the Hungate staff as a servant, tutor or gardener.
After the deaths of Lord and Lady Hungate, Nicholas moved to the seat of the Constable family in East Yorkshire. Burton Constable Hall has been their home for over 400 years. I've come to see Kelly Wainwright, curator, who can hopefully shed some light on the family history. Kelly, this is a beautiful house. What sort of time frame are we talking about? Well, the Elizabethan mansion that you've arrived at today was built in the 1560s, but some parts of the house date all the way back to the 12th century. So tell me about its owners, the Constable family. Well, the Constable family were a very wealthy Catholic landowning family that can be traced all the way back to 1190. And it's really in the 1560s when Sir John Constable, who had already inherited a huge amount of lands in the area, I think they owned lands around 40,000 acres, he was knighted by Mary Tudor, and then he went on to purchase the title Lordship of the Senior of Holderness for the sum of £4,000. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Phenomenal amount of money back and, then. And did that title bring extra wealth? And that title, yeah, that brought, gave him more lands and rights to goods and, and various other incomes. Um, so by far the wealthiest landowner in this area and thus required a residence to match. But even for the very wealthy, being a Catholic was a risky business then? Oh, absolutely. Um, we know that the Constable family here actually were quite good at evading many of the penal laws that were affecting Catholics at this time. And Sir Henry Constable renounced his Catholicism to, uh, to avoid paying these. His wife, however, Lady Margaret, uh, was less so. She was the, uh, the daughter of the staunchy Catholic politician, Sir William Dormer, and she courted danger through this priest that secretly ministered to her, which actually got her arrested in the 1590s and she was imprisoned in York. Was that a pattern that continued, the women in the Constable family being very Catholic and not being afraid to worship that way? The Constable men certainly did marry into, uh, into other Catholic families and with Lady Margaret continuing to reside here as well, that undoubtedly had uh, a bit of influence over her Catholic daughter-in-law as well. So Lady Mary was also a very devout Catholic and it was her who Postgate visited and ministered to her in later years when she was a widow. Now I understand you've got some documents from the period. Can we go and look at them? Yes, certainly. So what we have in here is a rather unusual document which was drawn up in 1610. And this is an indenture agreement drawn up between Dame Margaret and her son, Sir Henry Constable. Because rather unusually, Dame Margaret continued to reside here at the principal family residence when she was widowed rather than going off to the Dower House. And this is an agreement that Sir Henry drew up with his mother, just outlining where her chambers would be in the house and what room she was permitted to access, which included the long gallery to walk at her leisure. And undoubtedly the following year, when Sir Henry married Mary, another devout Catholic, his mother probably had quite a lot of influence over that decision. You have this scenario where you've got Lady Margaret here as well, who undoubtedly had a lot of influence over her devout Catholic daughter-in-law as well. So this document, sets up the conditions by which two very devout Catholic women are worshipping together under the same roof. Pretty much, yes. Kelly, where are we heading now? OK, so we're heading up into the attic rooms, which were chamber rooms in the Elizabethan house, because there's something quite interesting that I think you'd like to see. Lead on. So in here, these rooms would have been Lady Margaret's chamber rooms in the Elizabethan house. So as you can see here, we've got some historic graffiti with the initials MC and the cross, which is probably Margaret Constable, although it could be Mary Constable. So is this the connection to Postgate? Well, the connection to Postgate is that wealthy Catholic families such as this married into other Catholic families. And the early connection to Postgate is actually through Sir Henry's cousin, Everella Constable, who married Thomas Smith of Egdon Bridge, which was the family home of Postgate. So there was presumably that link there from a, an earlier date when Mary Constable was widowed, Sir Henry died at the Battle of Scarborough in 1645. She then resided at the Dower House at Halsham, and we know that Postgate later ministered to her there. Father Postgate stayed with the Constable family until 1659, when Lady Dunbar died. It's then believed he moved to Everingham to be with another branch of the family. During this time, he would have travelled the countryside, ministering to the secret Catholics, performing baptisms, marriages, burials, and saying mass. Around 1662, and now well into his 60s, Father Postgate returned to the North Yorkshire Moors. This was a major change. He had, for the first time, stepped outside the protective environment of the houses of the gentry. 
He adopted the lifestyle of a pauper. He was alone, and as a consequence, he was more vulnerable. The A171 is the main road across the moors from Whitby to Middlesbrough. You can see it gets quite busy at times today. This remote spot used to be known as Blackamoor. From here, Postgate carried on his ministry work, often travelling great distances on foot to Gisborough in the north, to Pickering in the south, and out towards Whitby on the coast. He lived on this quiet little lane in a humble building called the Hermitage. Now, clearly, back in the 1600s, there was no main road, but there was a network of pathways, making this a good place to establish a base so he could access the community around him. This site today would be unrecognisable to Father Postgate, but even so, the modern house here is still known as the Hermitage. Victorian records show that Postgate's house was still standing in 1838. It was a simple thatched cottage with lattice windows and a hearth for a peat fire. A publication of the Times, the Catholic magazine, said it was the poorest huts of the poor, only a cattle shed in appearance, just the small chimney denoting it as a human habitation. It's humbling to think that Postgate lived here for 17 years, caring not only for the Catholic community, but the Protestant one too. He's also said to have brought back some daffodil bulbs from France, which he planted outside his home, where they bloomed each spring. Perhaps he was also able to cultivate them during his time acting as the gardener at Hungate and Burton Constable. We just don't know. However, the sight of such vibrantly coloured flowers would have been a rarity reserved for the rich. A tulip bulb in those days would set you back two guineas. That's 600 pounds today. During this time, there was a lot of political upheaval in the country. In 1649, Charles I was executed at the hands of Oliver Cromwell. Meanwhile, the Protestant Puritan movement was on the rise. Then, following Cromwell's own death, the monarchy returned when Charles II came to the throne in 1660. Although Charles undoubtedly had Catholic sympathies, having inherited a staunchly Protestant parliament, he was in a precarious position. Charles did eventually convert to Catholicism, but only on his deathbed. With the politics at play in London, Father Postgate continued to attend to the spiritual needs of the people of the North Yorkshire Moors in relative peace. He must have been greatly respected. He kept a low profile, he was disguised as a gardener, and with the continued tolerance displayed by local people to recusants, well, nobody seemed prepared to report him to the authorities. Traditional beliefs suggest that secret signals were used. White linen hung out to dry on a particular hedge to announce when mass would take place. And sprigs of may blossom in a window, indicating that mass is said here. As well as houses in nearby Ugthorpe and Gromont, Father Postgate would have said mass for the gentry at grand local houses. And there are stories of isolated sites well off the beaten track for safety. One site in Egton we can be certain of is now known as the Mass House. Just up the road from Egton Bridge, it's obviously completely changed since Father Postgate's day, but back in the 1920s, it was a small thatched cottage. In 1830, a servant girl was cleaning the kitchen. Whilst washing part of the ceiling, the plasterwork gave way to reveal a long forgotten trapdoor with access to a hidden loft. She was amazed to discover a secret room with an altar, tabernacle and a missal, a crucifix and candlesticks all ready for a mass. There were even priests' vestments laid out ready to wear. This loft oratory had a lookout point tunnelled through the thatch and a walled shaft to allow a priest to escape to the nearby woods. Postgate would say mass in the loft, out of sight of his congregation. They would be assembled downstairs in the kitchen, and if anyone approached the house during the service, they would be able to warn him, and he could escape. Around a century or so later, major renovation work was taking place to the building. Unfortunately, the walls collapsed, but hidden in the thatched roof was found a small arms dish and a collection of coins, presumably for Father Postgate. These objects are some of the original relics of his life, and they're on display today at St Hedda's Church, 
in Egton Bridge. At this point in the story, it's worth turning to the role of Titus Oates, a man regarded by many as one of the villains of history. He was an Anglican, a Catholic, a Baptist, and then an Anglican again. He was kicked out of the Anglican Church, a Catholic seminary, and the Navy. At various times in his life, he was convicted of fraud, perjury, and blasphemy. In 1678, Oates claimed there was a Catholic plot to murder King Charles II. He even tried, unsuccessfully, to implicate the Queen and the King's own brother, the Duke of York, later James II. Oates presented his evidence to a magistrate, Sir Edmund Berry Godfrey. When Godfrey turned up dead, Oates said Catholics had murdered him to try and steal his evidence. As a result of that, three innocent Catholic men were tried and hanged. Oates's activity meant a wave of deeply anti-Catholic sentiment swept across the country. After Godfrey's death, his manservant, John Reeves, began a campaign of revenge against Catholics. He became an excise man here in Whitby, possibly because he already had suspicions priests were landed along the coast. Four miles south of Whitby lies the small village of Littlebeck. In 1678, Red Barn Farm was home to Matthew and Margaret Lythe, who were known recusants. Unfortunately for Matthew Lythe, he was overheard by John Reeves saying, the authorities should stop blaming Catholics for every wrongdoing in the country. Suspicions aroused, Reeves arranged for Red Barn to be searched. He was looking for weapons or other evidence to support Oates's popish plot. On the 8th of December, 1678, Father Postgate made his way to the farm to baptise the Lythe's new son, Ambrose. It was to be his final ever service. He had barely finished when John Reeves burst in with the local constables. Reeves may not have found evidence for his plot, but from the artefacts discovered in the house, he believed he had caught a Catholic priest in the act. Father Postgate was arrested, along with Matthew and two local farmers. They were all taken 15 miles south to Brompton Hall, where they were charged the next day by local justice of the peace, Sir William Cayley. Two constables gave evidence that Postgate was known to be working in the area as a priest, perhaps an indication of how even local law enforcement had turned a blind eye to his work over the years. Cayley decided there was enough evidence to commit Postgate for trial in York. The two farmers were released to help bring in the harvest. Matthew, though, refused to say anything to implicate Postgate. For that, he spent six months in prison. Father Postgate was taken to York Castle. In the 1500s, it was a dilapidated building used as a prison for local felons. Today, all that remains of the original structure is the keep, Clifford's Tower. Nicholas spent the long, cold winter months locked up, awaiting trial. Though he still had friends because he received money to help him through the tough prison system. Tradition has it he kept himself occupied by writing a hymn, one that is still sung today. On March the 16th, 1679, Father Postgate was taken from his cell to the Guild Hall in York. He was charged not in connection with the Popish plot, of which he was clearly innocent, but instead with treason under an ancient Elizabethan statute, essentially for being a Catholic priest who'd been abroad to train to then return to the country and practice the religion. Even in the late 1600s, Father Postgate would have been subject to the same sort of trial by jury that we see in a modern day court. Much like the people of Whitby, it seems the trial judge was sympathetic towards him, 
With no testimony offered from Matthew Lythe, the judge tried to have the case withdrawn. However, three witnesses came forward from the prosecution to say they had received sacrament in the popish manner. This room in the Guildhall is where juries would meet to discuss their verdicts. It was certainly used to decide the fate of other secretive Catholics at the time. So it's possible this is where they deliberated on the fate of Father Postgate. The evidence presented at his trial was enough to find him guilty. The only sentence available was to be hung, drawn and quartered. Postgate was no sooner back in his cell when one of the witnesses who'd spoken against him came begging for forgiveness. He blessed and comforted her and even gave her some money for the journey home. Five months later, on the 7th of August, 1679, Nicholas Postgate was taken from his cell, tied to a hurdle and dragged through the mud on the streets of York on his way to the gallows. But what was supposed to be a torment and humiliation for criminals became something of a triumphant procession for him. Supporters, both Catholic and Protestant, turned out to wish him well on what would be his final journey. This is the Knavesmire, just outside of York city centre. Here, there was a large wooden frame from which groups of criminals could be hung. Among the people executed at this spot include the notorious highwayman, Dick Turpin. At the age of 83, and in his final act, Nicholas Postgate addressed the crowd. Mr Sheriff, he said, you know I die not for the plot, but for my religion. I pray God bless the King and the royal family. I pray you, Mr Sheriff, tell the King that I have not offended him in any way. I pray God give him his grace and grant him the light of truth. I forgive all those who have wronged me and brought me to this death, and I desire forgiveness of all people. Contemporary reports suggest Postgate died quickly. At least he was spared the horror of the remainder of his punishment. As a last symbolic gesture against the Catholic faith, his thumb and forefinger were amputated as these held the host during the mass consecration. Postgate's body was given to his friends for burial, probably somewhere near this spot. Between 1537 and 1680, he was one of 52 men and women martyred here. Only one more followed him, Thomas Thwing, another Dowie priest, similarly accused of a plot against the king. The excise man John Reeves was paid a £3 gratuity for the charges against Postgate. He was later awarded a further 20 for the capture. However, it seems unlikely he ever received that particular payment. He was racked with guilt. His body was found here in the water at Littlebeck, less than a mile from Red Barn Farm. The site today is known as the Devil's Dump. As for Titus Oates's popish plot, well, two years after Father Postgate died, 15 innocent people had been executed. But public opinion began to turn against Oates himself. He was arrested for sedition and perjury. Imprisoned for life, he was sentenced to be whipped through the streets of London every year for five days. The judge openly regretted he couldn't impose the death penalty on Oates but he was later pardoned by the new monarchs William and Mary in 1689. He died in 1705, pilloried by the community and largely forgotten. Clearly, Nicholas Postgate is not forgotten in his native Eskdale. For over 400 years, people in this valley and across the moors have kept their Catholic faith 
despite major social and political upheavals. And it's thanks to the work of people like Father Postgate that the church remains strong in these areas today. Many of the known recusants from the 1600s are family names still found in the congregation. So just how successful was Postgate's mission to Yorkshire? Well, 34 years after he arrived here, he reported back to Dowie, and this is what he told them. He'd married 226 couples, he'd baptised 593 infants, he'd buried 791 dead. He'd also brought an estimated 2,400 people into the church. This is before you count masses, house visits and confessions. By any stretch of the imagination, that is an incredible achievement, and one which surely would only have been added to in the last 15 years of his life. Today, Father Postgate remains an iconic character in the Catholic and Anglican communities in Yorkshire. He was never a divisive figure, and even by people outside the church, he's respected as someone who died for what he believed. Father Postgate's work is honoured at a rally every July, and in 1987, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II, meaning he is now known as the Blessed Nicholas Postgate. A campaign has been instigated to secure the canonization of Nicholas Postgate as a saint, whilst his life and work is promoted by the Postgate Society, who meet regularly in Egdon Bridge and Ugthorpe. On our journey through Father Postgate's life, we've seen that the records of the time were not always kept accurately. Indeed, truths were concealed to protect the identities of Catholic priests. There are so many questions remaining unanswered. Why did he become a priest? Who paid for his training? And why did he want to return to his home parish? We can't even be sure what he really looked like, but perhaps the best way to remember him is as the figure depicted in Thomas Denny's magnificent stained glass window in St. Hedda's Church in Egton Bridge. It shows an old man walking on the moors en route to Pickering. He is leaning into the wind, a storm is approaching and his grey hair trails behind him. This is a gentle but determined old man on a sacred mission. <laughs> 